Good evening. Good evening. How are you today? It's still cool in Texas. <laughs> I, uh, I was in Mexico this weekend, and in Tuxla Gutierrez, uh, it's the capital of the state of Chiapas, it's like 95 degrees and humid, and I thought it's probably going to be just like home. But it's still not. We're not there yet. So thank God for that. Um, it's so good to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm Chad. I'm, I'm the missions pastor here at FBC, and I'm so happy to get to join you for a few minutes. Uh, I'm sorry I'm wearing shorts. <clears throat> uh, I would have been a little better prepared with my attire, but Jason called me about a half an hour before we started and said, hey, do you mind doing recharge tonight? And I said, well, <laughs> so I'm wearing shorts. And he said, you're going to be fine. So <clears throat> I'm happy to get to be with you. Um, we had a, a short mission trip. It was one week. We left last week. We did not promote that trip. It was a vision trip. Um, I wanted to take some, some people from our missions committee and, uh, and expose them to some work that I had done at the church I was at previously. And so there was four of us from FBC and four from the church in, in McAllen, Texas, Calvary Baptist Church, that met us there in Tuxla. And we drove up into the mountains of Chiapas. Has anybody in here been to Chiapas? All right, there's a hand. I love that. Chiapas is one of the most amazing places in Mexico. If you talk to many Mexicans who live uh, in Mexico, they'll tell you that Chiapas is the most beautiful state of Mexico. Now, if you've been to Mexico, there's a lot of beautiful parts of Mexico. Uh, but Chiapas has deep blue lakes and beautiful blue rios azules, they call them, blue rivers that are just gorgeous. It's high mountains. The city of San Cristobal, which is one of the, the tourist centers of the, of the state, sits at around 7,000 feet of elevation. And so the, the climate in San Cristobal, it maxes out around 70 degrees year-round and is about 40s and 50s in the evenings year-round. You know? And so it really has a, some beautiful places there. But let me explain it this way. When you land in Tuxla, you're about 800 feet above sea level. And four hours later, you're driving mountain roads that are anywhere between 5,000 to 8,000 feet. And uh, everywhere seems like it's forever, forever. We landed in Tuxla. We needed to go about 150 kilometers, which is not very far, to Simojovel. And it takes four hours because the roads are in such poor conditions. So you're, you're tracking these mountains, every valley, ups and downs. And then to compound your misery, uh, the communities there add a bunch of things they call topes. There's probably one guy in here that knows what a tope is, but it's a speed bump. But it's not a speed bump like you might imagine. These are speed bumps that are built like small hills. And so you drive up and you go across the top and then you drive down the other side. And, and uh, these speed bumps are so often, probably almost every 300 meters or so. So you speed up and slow down. Bump bump, speed up, slow down, bump, bump, and then you're going back and forth, curves up and down hills, and uh, you might imagine if you get seasick at all, this is not the trip for you. One of our team members within our first few hours threw up twice, and we thought she might throw up more, and, uh, and that was on day one. I thought, this is going to be a long trip. <laughs> Praise God, we had Dramamine, and uh, we had it in large supply, and uh, our team didn't have any more throwing up from that point forward. But listen, in all these hills and valleys and curves, there are the highest concentration of unreached people groups in North America. And what that means is that this is the, the, the highest um, population base of people who have never heard the name of Jesus um, within, I would say, close proximity to us. The two southern states of, of Mexico Oaxaca and Chiapas are where most of these people groups reside in North America. And they're places that have less than 2% evangelical Christians. And so there's places in those states where they can grow their entire life and never hear that if they ask Jesus to be the king of their life, they can be born again. Now you might realize that almost all these places are, are heavily Catholic. But these are the places where the, the Catholic Church came in several hundred years ago, changed the names of the local deities, and basically left it as it is. And so there's so much crossover of pagan ritual and, and, and work that's intermixed with Catholic, Catholic belief that they just don't know the gospel at all. There are some places where I know Catholics who are very, very Christian. They know Christ within their Catholicism. 
But there are some places where the Catholic faith has allowed such syncretism where the beliefs are so merged that there's no difference between what happened before the Catholics were there and what happens now. They do the rain dances at the right time of year and they, they sacrifice animals in some places to get God to do what they want him to do. And, and uh, there are still witch doctors in many of these tribe, in these villages that, that can call on the name of certain saints to get what they want. So they just changed the names. They Christianized the local uh, belief system and called it Christianity. And so this is what we're dealing with in almost all of these communities. And so what happened was two things. We got to commission a church that was about 12 years old, that it could be fully independent. It was fully formed. So we prayed with the church and said that you guys are everything that a church is supposed to be. Now you need to see that your mission has to go beyond your community. And so now you have the role to look outwards and take the gospel to the communities around you. They're already doing it. But we said this in an official manner. We had a ceremony and we prayed for them. Uh, the next day we went and, and commissioned uh, a, a, another small church. It was a, a newer church. It, was a, a, it took us six hours one way. We got up at four o'clock in the morning and drove six hours on these mountain roads to get to this church. And the last hour was on a rocky dirt road. I, there was no dirt, but there was no pavement. So that's the only way I can tell you. It was a rocky road. <laughs> Not the kind you eat after dinner. And... and you go up, 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 and we thought, there's no way this van's going to make it. And when we pulled off the road, we thought, oh, we must be there. <laughs> we had no idea. We had an hour continuing. And we passed through many communities before we finally got to the one we were going to. And this was called a, a Sotzil community. And the Sotzil people, the tribe, have a specific type of, of embroidery that they do on their, on their clothing. And so they all know each other before. We, we have no idea. They're just wearing clothes as far as we can tell. But all the communities know each other based on the type of of designs on their, on their clothes and the type of things that they, they wear. And, and, and in this place, we saw about 60 believers, 60 Christians in this community, and they're all the first-generation Christians in their families. Um, the story our, the pastor partner told us was that he was in San Cristobal one day shopping, and he met a man in the market, and he was telling him about Jesus, and the man became a believer and said, hey, I'm from a community in the mountains. Can you come and tell my family about Jesus? Now, I don't know if you remember, but I've been telling you guys about this person of peace. These people that welcome you into their life and their home, and they welcome the message of Jesus. They welcome the messenger that brings Jesus, and then they welcome the mission of Jesus in their life. And this guy was one of those guys. He invited Pastor Eofemio to go to this village, and he shared the gospel with his family. And now, 12 years, 15 years later, there's over 60 believers, and these believers are excited about what God's done among them and what they're going to do to reach the rest of the villages that are within walking distance of themselves. One lady walked three hours to spend the two hours that we were there. So we drove six hours one way and six hours back that same day. Can you imagine? It was a, a very long day for us, and we were exhausted when we got home. And it was all so we could spend those couple hours uh, with them. This was our, our team. And so oh, our last two days, and this is where I'm going to stop, we had a blessing because what our, our, our pastor friend, Ao Femio, is the missionary pastor we've worked with for years. He invited all of the churches to come together for a missions conference. And, uh, and he asked me to preach for three sessions. And then he asked our team and the team from Calvary to lead breakout sessions in between. And so in those two days, we had over 250 people who just wanted to talk about what it meant to see the gospel grow from themselves to others. And so we cast vision. What would it take to see the gospel take into every village in Chiapas? Over 50,000 villages. Super remote villages. These places, again, you can drive 5, 10, many hours and then have to hike into some of them. And we said, what's it going to take for the gospel to go to every single one of them? And I want to just share a couple of scriptures with you. The last time I shared with them, the last sermon I shared with them was about, I told them three things. I said, one is we can talk about the nations all day long, but if you're not abiding deeply in your father, you're not going to have anything to give them when you get there. So be, be faithful to follow Jesus. We talked about that from, from John 15. If I abide in you and you abide in me, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you will do nothing. And then we talked about what it means to, to endure persecution. Some places in Chiapas have had pastors killed. They've had churches torched by the communities where they were built. They bur burned them down and run them out of their cities. There's actually some places we know of where they've evacuated Christians out of communities that were violent so that they could live peaceful lives. 
And so we told some of these folks, these 200 people, listen, guys, it's not going to be easy. Not only do you have to deal with the normal problems that life brings you, and many of them live in very, very desperate poverty. Life is tough anyway. But on top of that, you have to deal with what may be a violent reaction from the community that you feel called to go to. How will you deal with it? And so we looked at John 17, where Jesus is praying for his disciples and says that they hate you because they hated me. You're not in this world. I mean, you're in this world, but you're not of this world. And this world is not going to love you because they don't know what you represent. They don't know who, you, who I am in you. And then I love this. He finishes... He, he, he takes a shift where he moves from praying for his disciples. And in verse 20, this is John 17, 20, he prays this. He says, my prayer is not just for them. He's one of his disciples. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. And you know what I love about that? As I'm staring at these 250 indigenous peoples, Sotzil, Setal, Soke, Chol, um, and I'm looking at them saying, God loves you. He's made you. He's given you dignity. He created you just the way you are. And 2,000 years ago, he prayed for you because he was thinking of you when he was looking at his disciples, those who would believe in me through your message. And church, that message is as meaningful in this place as it was in that jungle tent with some tarps up in the middle of Simohovel Mountains. And he doesn't stop there. If you go down just a little further, 22, he says, I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I and them, and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. It's a beautiful thing to see the full church, to see the whole church. It's a beautiful thing to be with believers who speak languages that I can't even begin to understand. When we were preaching in some of our sessions, we had translation going from English to Spanish, from Spanish to Sotzil, from Sotzil to Setal, and then there were some people who were Soke as well, and I don't even know how far down they had to go to get to those languages. The younger generation all speak Spanish. The older generations only speak their, their dialect. And you listen to them talk and you think, my goodness, God is at work among all of them. From the beginning of the world, he has been working to draw people from all people, all people from all languages and nations and tongues and tribes to himself. And some of these are seeing first fruits of believers in their own uh, cultural background. What an amazing thing that God is doing. And so I want to just leave you with this. Uh, this trip for me was incredibly fulfilling. Um, over the last 10 years, I've, this will be my fourth trip to Chiapas. What we started doing there in 2013 was, I thought, bold and interesting. But to see what's happened in the last 10 years, it's just overwhelming. It's overwhelming to stand somewhere and see what you hope for coming to life in front of you. And I pray that God would do the same thing with what God's doing in your heart now. These little seeds, these little ideas, these little thoughts, these little things like maybe I can share the gospel with my neighbor. These little tiny things that you wonder if they're even going to work. If you continue to pursue them and God blesses them, it could be something mighty in a short amount of time. Ten years all in all is not that big a deal. But there are hundreds, if not thousands, of new believers because of the work that Aofemio has been doing with our help over the last decade. And it was incredible to get to be a part of. I'm so thankful for you, church, for praying for us. I'm thankful for your contributions that make it possible for us to go on trips like this. I'm thankful for your willingness to partner in the work of the gospel. I'm thankful that we have faith that God's going to continue to do the good things that we, we pray for and hope for. Amen. Amen. Well, let's pray. <laughs> Father, you are worthy of all our applause. You are great and mighty and glorious, and we are so thankful for you. We, we're thankful for the work that you've done in our own hearts, God. We don't deserve your love. <laughs> Nothing we've done uh, is deserving of, of your overwhelming passion for us, Lord. And yet we are so so honored to be a part of it, God, that we can be conduits of your love and mercy to the world around us. 
God, today I pray for our friends in Chiapas. I pray for Eofemio and all of the disciples and leaders and pastors and ladies who cook and care and serve. God, I thank you so much for every part of the Chiapaneco church. And I pray, God, that you would bless them. Continue to give them energy and resources to go to the lost, the unreached in their communities. I pray that you would give them favor in the communities where there is anger and distrust and frustration and even violence. I pray that you would draw village leaders to become followers, Lord, and help them to become the future pastors. God, we pray for those who will hear the message and respond. Lord, we praise you that we are among them. And we pray that you would use us for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys have a great night.